think you go into a final episode uh, with the hopes that uh, there's going to be a little bit more money to do production, that you get a little bit more bang for the buck because they know this is the last thing people are going to see for six months and then you have to bring an audience back. Here we are, second last day of shooting and uh, all I'm hearing is complaining. People don't want me to leave. They, want, they, they don't care about, about whether they have scripts or anything like that, they just want to shoot. They don't, I've never heard that, I've never heard them say that they wanted to be so with they want, either they, of us. In they they just want to be with one of the Martins. I'll leave it to you to decide. Can you get, let me know who said that? Because I'd like to talk to them. Yeah, I, I've never heard that person. Like I'm down on set a lot, and I never, I've never heard that. Uh, yep, I can tell you. That guy right there, he's over there. I didn't see him. Do you have a name? Yeah, his name's Mike. As I said, at the end of the year, everybody is really tired. And although everybody sort of rallies the troops and, and sort of, you know, uh, buttons their coats up tight and, and sort of gets up to the top uh, of the hill, everybody's still tired. And it's the look of people who have worked nine months straight, 12 hours a day um, on a show. And everybody's really happy that it's going to be done. And everybody's really happy we're coming back. But everybody's really happy to go on vacation. Final shot for season three. Kind of sad. I'm over it. <laughs> no, I'm sad again. When you live on a show, uh, you are constantly looking for new ways to shoot the same thing. And I think a big part of it for me since the, the, the beginning of Atlantis is trying to make Atlantis look bigger. We're in a city and we actually only have five rooms. You have to make five rooms look like something different. And one of the ways you do that is by showing people walking a great distance. The only way to get it to happen though is to actually have the camera operator draw back from the floor, step onto a crane, go up in the air with a crane, come across, go across the, uh, the room, which is a fairly big room, and land on the balcony before uh, Shepard and McKay come around the corner and then take him into the room. Now in the edit, you actually don't see the end of the shot, which was uh, we come all the way around inside the room with McKay. Um, you can see it in the raw footage, but you don't see it in the actual shot. I think one of the things that people don't think about is when you're flying a city, there's a sense of weight that you don't have. Um, when you take off in a rocket ship. For me, a big part of it was conveying the size of the city in, in terms of the weight of the city and having to get this thing to lift off. Where Martin Garrow did a, such a beautiful job of putting this together is that he created a, an intercut uh, in the script that worked so well where we've got some furious activity happening uh, in one spot and furious activity happening in the other, but the actors don't have to be running around, scrambling around, you know, the way we usually are when, you know, your ship's falling apart or something like that because this is a big, huge city. What I did with, uh, with Shepard is, I actually did something we haven't done before because we haven't flown the city, um, we haven't seen the city flying, is I, I had the chair rotating. And the chair was rotating mostly because uh, otherwise it would be a guy sitting in a chair with his eyes closed. So the same thing I did with the, the, uh, the dolly up in the, in the uh, control room is I dollied uh, a continuous move which sort of gives a little bit of uh, scope to the room but also sort of a little bit of weight to it. Long vis effects are so costly because you have to continually animate something through space and so you actually have to build a three-dimensional world for that thing and if it falls for a minute it has to have a three-dimensional world that is a minute long. When um, Martin came to me to tell me about the, the script he said there's gonna be a vis effects that's one minute long. You're with me on this right? <laughs> and I went yeah uh, that's great. Martin really wanted this thing to last a minute, and so uh, it, we designed the shot that would last a minute. He had written it out in, in uh, the script, and we essentially followed exactly what he wanted in the script. Our production designer, James, and I sat down, and James actually mapped it out, and we, uh, we virtually followed the bomb into these different positions. And then VisFX took that and ran with it, and of course it always looks a million times better than I actually imagined in my head when, uh, when our VisFX team gets a hold of it. One of the other guest stars we have, of course, is David Ogden Stiers, who comes back as uh, the leader of the Replicators. And uh, it's very funny because uh, David drove up from Los Angeles uh, to get up here, and we literally had him in one shot. And it feels like it's more than that, but what actually happens is when you're watching the shot, you see um, Weir and McKay are standing there, and truthfully, David Ogden Stiers is about seven feet away from them, standing on the balcony. And they're actually talking to each other in the same room, but uh, David and Tori have their back to David.
He came up for one shot. Yeah. And then turned around and drove back. When we were casting for The Colonel of the Apollo, Martin Garrow came in and said, we were looking at these guys, and, and one of the guys on the list was Michael Beach. And I wanted Michael right away, and Martin wanted Michael right away. Both of us looked at each other and went, you think he'll do sci-fi? And when he came in, it was really interesting. Um, Michael s sat down with me for about 10 minutes and said, um, let me talk to you about my guy. He was asking very pertinent questions about how does this fit into the grand scheme of things. He asked all the right questions and then that performance that you see came out of him almost right away. There was no tweaking on, on uh, Michael Beach's command. We're about to um, smash all the glass in here and uh, it hasn't been approved by anybody. We're going to see what happens to me afterwards. When you're doing uh, the most dangerous things in film and television, for the most part, it's a very, very tiny piece of film. Because uh, the more dangerous the gags, the more safety things you have happening around it. The hardest part of doing a stunt is hiding the stunt person from the audience. And the shock wave is going to take her, go. as we've seen in many ratchets on the show, and send her flying from this position here. She's going to uh, skip the stairs. It's going to land by him. What I want to do is I want to put her right in front of the window. Now, to do that, it's in a whole bunch of different cuts. We, we move Tori down into that spot. We move uh, our, uh, Chris, our, our secondary uh, stunt person, down in there. And the reason he's in there is to show that it's not just a setup just to hit Weir with window. You know, it, We wanted to actually make it look like there was nothing going to happen. And then suddenly when this happens, it takes everybody by surprise. And again, it's this big. <laughs> I shoot it with multiple cameras, just in case this camera doesn't see it, this camera is going to, or this camera is going to. And, and theoretically, I mean, if I, if I could, I'd cover it from seven or eight different angles, and then you do what's called a double cut in it. For a stunt that, that's dangerous, you rehearse it as many times as possible to reduce the number of problems you're going to have with it. And of course, one of the problems that we didn't foresee in the rehearsal, because we kept bringing her out and dropping her on the, on the mat, and bringing her out and dropping her on the mat, and it looked perfect for the cameras, but of course then, in the stunt, we added the jeopardy of the glass. We have a stunt person who's standing at the top of the stairs with a clear plastic mask on. And the clear plastic mask is really because all this glass is shattering literally into her face. Um, and being blown at her by these cannons. Um, the explosion was, was so powerful. The glass passed the stunt person past the stunt woman and landed on the pads before she got there. My rigger, Corbin, was very quick on the button and he held her up. So she got a bit of a pendulum at the end uh, after she went out of frame and then she penduled back in the frame. But if she, he would have let her land on the pads, she would have been ripped to shreds by the uh, glass that was covering the pads. So she actually came down and went boing like that and came off of it. So she almost landed on her feet, uh, which is why they, they, you don't really see a weird landing moment. Uh, it was too dangerous. Are there any cuts or bruises? Uh, no. <laughs> Thank goodness for such a good coordinator looking after me with the mask. <laughs> hey, the mask was uh, Martin's idea. The mask is always good for a good uh, glass blowout, I've always said, every time I do one. This time we got a good mask. It actually, it's so much easier than having to replace your face. What's interesting is we really had a lot of fun on this episode because we knew we were picked up already. <laughs> and every year we've done all these finales where it's like, oh, I hope we get picked up, hope we get picked up. This is one of the first years that we've ever known early that the show is picked up for next year. So it's like, ah, let's do whatever we want. We're picked up for next year, so. Last episode, season three. Standing in the same spot I was during the last episode of season two. And the last episode of season one, actually. But in season two, I was actually on Andy's set. It wasn't my set, so I didn't have anything to do. What? It's the end of the season. It's awesome. It's great. Can't wait to come back next year.